So our final module for the day is by our gracious host, Professor Robert Quimby. Uh, Robert holds the distinction of not just being a professor at San Diego State University, but also the director of Mount Laguna Observatory. He's the only director in the room, so you have to pay extra attention. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tell us what you observed. All right. Uh, good afternoon. How are you guys doing? Are we holding up all right? Do we, we cram enough down your brains yet? Not yet? All right. Ready for more? Um, this is, and it shouldn't be too, too in-depth, so I, th I think you guys can manage. All right. It's a good, good end for the day today. Um, we're going to talk about observing room preparation. So this is a very, very practical oriented uh, uh, lecture and the module that goes with it. Uh, we're really all about just what do you actually do before you have an observing run so that you get ready and you're prepared when you actually get there. Uh, a little bit of motivation, uh, when you use something like a, a telescope, when you use a resource like a telescope, um, there are some costs associated with that. There's, there's kind of the practical cost, like the dollar amount of you know, how much you use the telescope, uh, how much it costs to run a telescope for a night which is pretty high, by the way. I'm not going to tell you how much it is because it might scare you guys. Um, but it's up there. Uh, but there's also the, the cost of, uh, of your future. So, you know, if you're uh, a young student and you're, you got a, you're lucky enough that you got a night on a telescope, uh, this is your chance um, to, to get data that you're going to use for, you know, your thesis or for your job talks or for, you know, applying to faculty positions ultimately. So you want to make sure that you maximize your time at the telescope. It's very important that you get every, every uh, bit of information that you can uh, during those runs. Um, so what you're trying to do, I'm going to be over here, I'm going to be over here. Um, what you're trying to do, and I'm going to take a very um, optical observing slant here, is you're trying to collect photons. Uh, and you're gonna, you can have a metric of how well you're doing by uh, looking at how many photons you, you collect in total, so you can think about a metric of I want to maximize the number of photons that I get, uh, or you can have maybe a, a certain number of targets and you want to get as many of those targets as you possibly can in that one night uh, or during your observing run, um, and for each one of those you have some, some minimum goals, like you need to get a certain number of photons to meet some signal to noise requirement, for example. So these are, are kind of two possible ways to look at it. There's, there's other metrics that are, are probably a little bit better, but th these will get you started. So. This is what we're doing today. We're not talking about, you know, uh, gravitational wave of observing and stuff, which has, you're not collecting photons, obviously, or neutrino kind of work. We're, we're, we're optical observers, maybe infrared observers today. Uh, and we've been awarded time on a classically scheduled telescope, and we're trying to figure out how we can get the most out of that time we've been awarded. Um, so I kind of said what we, we want to do is we want to maximize the amount of photons we want to get to do this. You want to make sure that your shutter is open right, when you're, when you're taking those pictures, uh, and you want to do that as much as possible, right, so if your shutter is closed, um, you're not doing anything useful, right, well, you could be doing other things, right, um, you could be drinking coffee or something, that's useful in some level, but, but your science, uh, you're not getting any science so you're not, it's not, not uh, improving your, your chances of, of getting to that PhD program or that, that postdoc you want, um, so make sure that your, your shutter is open as much as possible, and you got to plan how, how are you going to make that happen. you got to think about a little bit in advance and be ready for all the things that might happen. Um, and kind of related to this is you're going to find out through this, this lecture that you want to also make sure you're looking up, right? Because there's a lot more photons coming from up. Uh, not so much over here, or definitely not over here. Here, you're crazy, can't do that. But you want to maximize your, your looking overhead. So we want to make sure we have a plan where we're looking kind of up as much as possible, and we have the shutter open. Uh, so we can get what we want. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be taking the uh, tact in this talk that you're, you have a classical scheduled night. So it's not like you're using HST or something. You're not using a, um, a survey. You're not using ZTF data. That data just comes for you and you just download it and you're done. You're actually going to the telescope and observing and that means you're on the ground because uh, we don't have any space-based uh, uh, visitor programs yet. Uh, working on that? Maybe you can get that? No, okay. Right. You're tweeting? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so there's a few things you got to keep in mind when you're observing from the ground, right? Uh, you know these things. Most of this stuff is kind of review. I just want to make sure it's on the top of your head as you're, as you're planning uh, your observing, which we're going to do tonight, remember. We're actually going to go and observe. So maybe you can actually put this to use tonight and find something to observe. Um, 
Here's a little all-sky movie, uh, just looking up. And this is just to remind you that during the day, there's, there's one star that you can really see very well. And then otherwise, it's not a great time to observe. So one of the important things that you need to concern uh, to, to figure out is when does that star go away, and when do the other ones appear? All right, because then it gets much more interesting. There's a lot more you can do during night. So make sure you know that. And you also have to worry about the moon rise and moon sets, things like that, because the moon also can ruin your party too. All right. So these are things that you need to think about before you even show up to the telescope. You know, what? How much time do I have to observe before the sun comes up? All right. Um, this is kind of a classic way to, to show this. Uh, I actually like to, to show this a little bit differently. So to remind you, if I go this way, um, this is basically that same data, but I'm just going to show it a different way here. Um, we saw there the stars, you know, going over the head, over your head, kind of passing over time. It's very easy to get a kind of self-centered view where you see everything. You're here, and everything is just moving past you. But uh, I want you, I want you to play. Uh, I want to remind you that really what's happening is that the Earth is rotating. Right? And everything is basically staying the same. Sun moves a little bit, moves a degree per day, but for the most part, your field of view, you have this window into the sky, and that window is moving over uh, the celestial sphere over time. So when night falls, the star's pretty much in the same spot, but again, your window is rotating through the sky. So it's a little bit, this is the picture you should have in your head, uh, so you're, you're really understanding what's going on here. And it's fun to look at too, right? All right, um, so to, to make your planning work, you've got to have this kind of picture in your head, and you've got to understand that this is just going around and around. It's basically a clock, right? That's really what it is. The Earth is spinning around, you've got a clock. So you've got to have that clock in your head as an observer so you know the timing of things. You know, at some time, the sun's going to set. At some time, twilight's going to hit. At some time, this is going to happen. So you have to know when your targets are up, and they're going to be moving across the sky with time. So make sure you have that um, in your head as well. Uh, so a convenient coordinate system to, to keep in your head is this hour angle and declination coordinate system. Uh, this, is, this is kind of an observer-centric, uh, so we switch from the Earth rotating to everything rotating around us again. Um, but this is basic information that every observer should have in their head. Uh, so first of all, um, I, I believe you guys all know there's, there's this idea of the celestial sphere, which is you just take all the objects and you project them off into infinity onto this imaginary sphere. Right? And that's, we, can, we can put coordinates on that grid however we want. Usually we call them R and deck. So you pick some spot, we're going to call that zero. And then we have declination going up like this. And we have longitude coordinates or right ascension going around like that. Uh, because the Earth is rotating and we're not at the pole, there's some angle between where this pole is and us. Right? For us, this is about 33 degrees down here in San Diego. Um, and from our perspective, if you're this stick figure person here standing on this disk, um, this is your horizon. You can't see anything below you. Uh, you can look straight up. It's zenith, that's an important thing to know. Zenith is straight overhead. And at this angle here, you have the celestial north pole. So to you, everything seems to be spinning like this. If you're self-centered, uh, of course, everything, the Earth is spinning this way, and it's just everything appears to be going the other way. Um, so have that in mind. Make sure you know which way is north. If you're in the northern hemisphere, maybe if you're in the southern hemisphere, you might have a different slant. But do you guys know which way is north? Who can point north? Did we just get off planes? We don't know where we are? That's north. All right, so always know where north is, because that's kind of an important direction if you're in the northern hemisphere. Um, and then you know once you know which way north is, you know things are going to be rising this way and setting that way. So we have this, in, this idea in our mind that our box kind of starts here, target comes up, goes down, and then that's, that's the end of it there. Um, Okay, so the coordinate system that we use, we, we align this kind of blue grid here is showing you uh, what you can think of as that uh, celestial sphere with the coordinates aligned on, uh, as right ascension and declination. So we have an equator here where it's declination zero, and then as you go towards the pole, you get up to declination 90, of course, uh, and you go the other way to, to minus 90. And then we have these lines of longitude going around here. Those are your right ascension lines, um, if you want to think about it that way. But if, you, if you're... Standing on the ground, it's important, uh, it's, it's convenient sometimes to think of actually, instead of right ascension, to think of hour angles, right? Because hour angle is going to tell you, that's your, that's your clock again, that's telling you how much time do I have to get this target. What is the hour angle of my target, right? You tell me the right ascension of it, doesn't really tell me how much time I have to observe it. Um, hour angle helps you with that. So the hour angle is dusty. So first, we need to consider this uh, imaginary line, which goes from the point in the south, through Zenith, through the North Pole, and uh, to the North Point. 
uh, and that is the meridian. So that's a line that just goes right overhead like this. Right? That's your key line. Uh, that's halfway up. Right? Things are rising up there, and then they go down. So when something is on the meridian, that's where you want to observe it. It's as high as it's going to get. At any declination, one like this, that's as high as it's going to get. It's going like that, that's as high as it's going to get. So that's where you want to do all your observations. As close to this hour angle uh, zero as possible. So that's the definition of a hour angle zero is the meridian line here. Right. So try to maximize your targets. You want to minimize their hour angle, the absolute value of their hour angle. All right. <clears throat> um, so we do have this concept. This is changing, of course, over time. So targets, they're here and they're moving over time. So the hour angle of the target is changing over time. Its declination is not. It's constant, but its hour angle is changing over time. So we need some way to calculate what that hour angle is. The way we can do this, there's a simple relationship between the right ascension of a target and its hour angle, and they're related by this quantity here, the LST, the local sidereal time. This is your time where you are on the Earth. Uh, so you can see from this equation, all this really means is that when the hour angle is zero, when a target is on that meridian line, that means that the local sidereal time equals the right ascension. Right? So the hour, the, um, hour angle zero means that your RA is equal to the local sidereal time, or another way to think of it is the local sidereal time is the right ascension that's on the meridian. Right? And so as time pr progresses, you get larger and larger uh, right ascensions come and meet the meridian, right? and so your local sidereal time increases. And then, of course, it does this about um, you know, 24 hours a day. Not exactly, because it's a sidereal day, so it's a little bit different. But very, for, for today's purposes, close enough. Uh, so you have, uh, if you tell me the right ascension of a target and its LST, you can calculate its hour angle, and you have some idea how long you have before it gets up, and then how long uh, you have before it's going to set. Uh, so how do we do this in practical terms? Um, all you really need to know is what your um, longitude is on the Earth. All right? You have to know your longitude. You have to know what time it is locally. Um, and you have to know where in the Earth's orbit it is. Right? Because at, at midnight, at different times of the year, you're pointing at a different part of the celestial sphere. So um, you can work this out yourself. But of course, there's things built in that will work for you. So let's just use those. So really all you need is just specify your longitude. This happens to be the longitude of Mount Lungan Observatory, where we're going to be tonight. I'm also specifying for later the latitude and height of the observatory. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, uh, an object I'm going to call MLO, which is the location on Earth. So I'm using an uh, astral plan um, module here, uh, Earth location. I just specify latitude, longitude, height. And it says that's your coordinates on the Earth. Let me just run this. And then uh, we can specify time. You can put any time you want in here. I picked the convenient time here that might be important to you. This is 2019-08-06, um, so August 6th at 4 o'clock in the morning. You guys have any idea what this time is? It's a, it is in universal time. That's what this time object from AstroPi wants. Um, but what time of day is this? When is this? When, when in time is this? Is this right now? Is this in the future? When is this? Yes? When we'll be observing tonight, exactly. Yeah, this is a few hours from now. The uh, local side here time is close to, it's, no, it's a little bit shy of uh, midnight, so we're still got a few hours to go. But uh, this is about when you'll be observing. So we should know what things are going to be like there. And then we want to know what the local sidereal time is there. So we can just ask our time object what the sidereal time is for this location uh, at this particular time. And it'll tell us local sidereal time is going to be about 17 hours. So this is giving us a clue right now. We're going to be observing tonight at around 9 o'clock. Uh, if we want to look overhead, we want targets that are close to this right ascension. All right. That makes sense? All right. There's other right ascensions you can observe. Right. This just happens to be a convenient one. All right, so that, that's the first thing we, we got down. We, we have this clock that's ticking away. Uh, the next thing we need to, to keep in mind is that, um, you know, why I keep saying we want to observe it when it's straight overhead. Why is this so important? Um, the main reason for this is because we have an atmosphere on Earth. So it's not just a big spinning ball. It's a big spinning ball with an atmosphere, right? And that atmosphere is another thing that gets in our way. Like the ground, it's really annoying. You can't see through the ground. 
The atmosphere, at least it's opaque, you know, you can kind of see through it, but it's not perfectly clear. And the more atmosphere you look through, the worse it gets. So we need to have a, a, a measure of how much um, um, atmosphere we're looking through so we can minimize that. All right, so how we can calculate this, we'll just call, it's hard to say exactly how much is overhead, so we're just going to call that one, right? So if you're lying in your back, you're looking straight overhead, we're going to call that typical atmosphere one. That's one air mass, all right? And then obviously as you look at a, a greater and greater angle, the amount of, you know, the length of this line here is going to increase as you go over, right? So uh, let's get a sense now for how much more atmosphere we're going to be looking at. The way we're going to do this is we're going to use the plane parallel approximation. Uh, this is where you just assume that you have a, a nice flat Earth, uh, a nice flat atmosphere. This is a very popular model. It's becoming more popular with time. Um, not a correct model, <laughs> um, but it's, it, the math is easy, so we'll stick with that. There's, there's some reason to use this. Um, anyway, so you can calculate what this is. If you know that this side is 1, and you want to figure out, by the way, capital X is air mass. That's why we're using this. If you want to know what this length is in terms of this, you got a right triangle there. You know you're going to have a cosine involving z here. Z is your zenith angle. It's your angle from zenith, right? It's the complement to the altitude, right? Which is the angle from the horizon. Um, so if we work that out, we just figure out that one over x is the cosine of z. So we usually just say that the air mass x is the secant of your zenith angle, right? Again, this is a plane parallel approximation. Uh, if you're not a flat earther, you can use this equation. Um, that's a little me messy for me, um, but it, you know, it, it's, secant z is actually a pretty good approximation, so we'll just stick with that. I'll, I'll actually show you how this works. So let's just take a look at what air mass does as you change zenith angle. Right, so I'm just going to create a NumPy. I'm going to create a whole bunch of different uh, va variables for, uh, values from 0 to 90. These are going to be my, my zenith angle, so all the way down to 90. Create 1,000 of those. I'll create the complement, the altitude. Uh, and this is the, the complicated air mass calculation if you want to do it with a, a round earth. Um, this is the simple calculation if you just want to do it with a flat earth. And we can see what the difference is in these. And we'll plot the, um, the air mass which, with respect to zenith angle. So here I have zenith angle from 0 to 80. 90 is over there. And this is the air mass. Uh, Here's one, of course, that's our definition. So when you're looking straight overhead, you're looking at air mass one. And as you move away from directly overhead, you pretty much stay close to, to air mass one for a while. And then it starts to increase a little bit. And then it just, all right. And I'm plotting again, I'm plotting the, uh, the real one and the flat earth version. And they're basically pretty much the same until you get out here, right? The flat earth model goes up to infinity, right? Air mass is not infinity. You can actually measure it. One of the many ways you can prove the earth is not flat. Uh, it actually stops about 39 or so. Um, okay, so what we're learning from this, though, is that if you're looking overhead and you're looking within maybe 30 degrees or so of overhead, right, which is about um, so one of these and one of these, that's 30 degrees at arm's length. So if you're looking within this of zenith, then um, your mass is pretty much the same. So you can anywhere around here is a good place to observe. When you start getting away from there, if you get to 60 degrees, which is about here, right, then you've got an air mass that's two. So there's twice as much air as there was up here. So twice as much stuff in your way that you don't want there. And then when you start getting to air mass, you know, three or four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, it, it really explodes really quickly. Uh, and this is bad news uh, because there's a lot that happens as you get lower and lower, not just the mass of the air, and it really ruins your day. A um, couple things happen that you should know about. So there we go. Here's the sun. Um, you guys have any extra time here? Like you just come with this, or do you got like a couple extra days? We smart and said, I'm going to San Diego. I'm going to the beach at some point. Did you think about that? Some of you did. All right. Some, if you get a chance, go to the beach. Enjoy the sunset. It's a nice thing to do. Um, you'll notice when the sun sets that it is pretty to look at and it's red. Uh, you'll notice when the sun is directly overhead that it is uh, it burns your eyes, uh, and it's not fun, fun to look at. So uh, something changes with, with altitude of the sun. And what's going on, of course, is that the atmosphere is getting in the way. It's blocking light, and that blocking light does two things. It makes it fainter, and it makes it redder. Right? This happens to a star like the sun. It happens to other stars that are also in the sky at night. Same thing happens. 
Doesn't matter if it's day or night. Um, so this is why we don't want to look at things at high air mass. One of the many reasons we don't look at things at high air mass. Uh, because as the, as the target gets lower and lower, the atmosphere starts blocking the light, your target gets fainter. Um, and uh, this is wavelength dependent. Blue light gets preferentially blocked, as you guys all know. Um, so as the target sets and sets, you know, bluer targets start looking red and they start getting really faint. So that's bad news. We want to collect photons and they're, they're not coming to us anymore. They're, they're getting absorbed in the atmosphere, scattered in the atmosphere. So that's not going to work. Um, mathematically, there we go. Uh, it looks something like this. So we'll, we'll start with some, um, this is the M here is the, the magnitude that we would observe if there was no atmosphere. Uh, and then we have this air mass effect. So it's, the star is going to be a little bit fainter. We're adding to magnitude, so it's getting fainter. Uh, we have some constant proportionality here that's uh, determining how, how uh, it varies with air mass. There's also this color effect, as we're saying, it gets redder, so we have to account for that too. Um, so you, the real, the, the magnitude you observe is going to be fainter than the, the real uh, magnitude, and it can be significant. So in this tiny, tiny table down here, I, I show you typical values for K1. These are in the UV VRI bands, which are, this is kind of ultraviolet, blue, uh, visual red, infrared ish. Um, and you can see that in magnitudes, if you're in, say, B band, so if you're looking at blue light, 40% uh, of the light is lost per air mass. Right? So if you go to air mass uh, 2, you're losing a lot, of air, a lot of light. If you go to air mass of 10, uh, you're losing a lot, a lot of light. So you want to make sure you minimize uh, your air mass because of that. Uh, on top of this, there's other bad news. It's not just the amount of light you're losing. Uh, there's other effects. Um, seeing gets worse. So you guys were talking in the previous module about putting down apertures and measuring uh, the signal in some aperture. Well, when your target gets lower, the seeing, so the, the, P, the effect of PSF that you get from the atmosphere, that gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Right? It roughly increases uh, with the square root of the air mass. So at an air mass of four, your, your seeing disk is twice as big as it would be at an uh, air mass of, of one. Um, but keep in mind, if you, if you look at that signal-to-noise calculation, I don't know if you got to that, but signal-to-noise goes with the aperture area. So it goes with the square of that radius. So that means basically if you go from air mass 1 to air mass 2 and you want to maintain the same signal-to-noise, you've got to double your exposure time. All right. So now you're starting to understand. We really want to look overhead. because you go just a little bit, now we've got to double our exposure time for the same information. That's not a good deal. Uh, and it blows up. Remember, once you get to air mass 3 or 4 or 5, now you've got a huge increase. Uh, on top of that, let's say you're looking at a faint object, which as we often do. If you look at a faint object, you are dominated by the noise from the background. That's your key noise, right? So the larger your aperture, the more noise you got in. That's why you got to increase your signal noise. But also, um, the sky brightness tends to get brighter, right? Sky brightness is correlated with how much air you're looking through. So more air means brighter sky. Also, you get more reflection from... Uh, uh, scattered light from light pollution sources. So especially if you're in Mount Laguna and you start looking west and you get farther and farther down, you find San Diego. And San Diego is pretty bright. So your, your signal noise, you know, for the same exposure time, rapidly decreases with air mass. Right. All right. So look up. That's, that's, that's really all I said there, right? Just look up. You guys got it. All right. All right, so more to do. So um, when you're observing, you've got to have something to look at. Uh, I can't tell you what to look at. That's something you guys can actually do in the module. You guys can figure out what you want to look at. Uh, you probably want to have a science driver for doing that in, in uh, maybe not tonight, but in, in general. Uh, so you've got to make a list of targets uh, that you want to look at. This is going to be dependent on whatever your science is. Um, and usually you write that down and you make it into a list that looks something like this, where you have you know, the names of your targets, you have the right assumptions, destinations. And you have... Um, Epic here. This is just some uh, reference to where is RA0 and DEC0. You need to know where that is because we're astronomers and we like to change that over time and move it around for different systems. So you got to have this number here that say what, what 0, 0 corresponds to. Uh, so you make a list like this of all your targets. Um, I have a list I'm going to load real quick just for fun. Um, and then um, I like to as I was showing you earlier, I like to do things in terms of hour angle, so I'm going to convert those right ascensions into hour angle so I can make a plot. So all that is, this is a lot of code here, but all it really does is just take the local sidereal time, which you calculate from some time, 
and you subtract off the RA. That's all we're really doing here, and you get the hour angle. Then you convert it because you want it to be between minus 12 and plus 12, right? Hour angle of uh, 23 doesn't mean anything. It needs to be uh, one way or the other. All right, so I run that. And then we can make a visibility plot. So I, this is, um, this is, I like this plot. This is different than you'll do it in the module. People don't usually do it this way, but I think this is a nice illustrative way to show you what's going on. So this is our angle here. These are negative 10, negative 5, 0, 5, 10. So remember, these are rising targets, and these are setting targets over here. This is declination here, 20, 40, 60. And these are your, your targets. So this is for one particular time, right? Over time, these objects are going to shift this way, right? So you can look at apply again. You can say, OK, at this time, here's where my targets are. That one, that's below this here, which corresponds to an air mass of 3. Right, so this is, can't observe. This is the sweet spot right here. This is overhead. This is kind of within 45 degrees of overhead. This is air mass two right here. Uh, so you can see you have several targets that are pretty good to get. This one is starting to set. Maybe I'll get that one first, and I'll get these other ones next, and later I can get to that one. So I like to make a plot like that. Um, after you have an idea of what you're gonna observe, uh, you need to be able to find it when you get to the telescope. I mean, in a, in a perfect world, you point the telescope and it all be set up and you just take data and you're good, but that's not how things work. Uh, often you'll point the telescope and maybe the telescope didn't point where you wanted it to, or maybe you have to very, very precisely look at your target. Um, so to do this, you need a finding chart. So a finding chart is just a picture with some information on it to help the observer, which might be you or might be, you might be handing this off to somebody else to do, you're observing for you. Um, you know, someday you'll be faculty and you have students and you just say, hey, go do this, right? So it works, yeah. <laughs> Those are my students. Um, so uh, you give them a, a finding chart that has a target name on it, positions on it. Um, it looks something like this, right? Something like that. So you have a nice big bold name on the top, the positions, again, the epic. Uh, and then you have a picture of the field and you have some, some critical information. So you need that label of your target. I want this thing here. Maybe that's an interesting galaxy. I don't care. I want the supernova. I'm a supernova guy. So make sure you label that clearly. Make sure you say uh, how it's oriented. So you want north up and east to the left. Does that make sense? East to the left. It's different than when you look at a map, right? When you look at a map, it's always east is that way. Make sure astronomers, we're not looking down at the earth. We're looking up at the sky. All right, so there's a, there's a flip there. Make sure you put east to the left, north up. And you also got to label the scale here. This is one arc minute labeled here. So you have some idea of how big the field is. And you send this off to uh, the telescope with you or with your observer, uh, and they can identify when they point to the field, they'll take a quick image and say, oh, there's a supernova, or I, I can't see that, but I can see this star over here, and I know I can do an offset. Uh, give them the information here. All right. All right, a few more things to consider. You gotta know how long to expose. Um, this, of course, depends on how bright your target is. It depends on what instrument you're using. It depends on all kinds of things. Again, it depends on the air mass. How far down are you looking? There's a lot of things that you can put into this. Um, there are some um, exposure time calculators. If you're lucky, there might be an exposure time calculator for the instrument that you're using. Um, for most instruments, it probably doesn't exist, and it's something you need to figure out yourself, or you need to talk to somebody who's using it. Uh, instrument before to get a, uh, a handle on it. Um, there is some uh, some resources online. NOAO has some nice resources, so you can go to their webpage and you can say, "I have a. I'm going to use CTIO's uh, four meter, and you know you're going to say I'm not a 20th magnitude for that. You know, maybe a 25th magnitude object, single ratio of 10, and you'll you'll say how long do I need to expose, and it'll tell you uh, that you need. Um, that's a long time. So you need, you need uh, what's that? Uh, half hour, a little more than that, 40 minutes for that target. All right? Um, and you can scale off of this depending on your size, your aperture. You can scale off of it. Uh, these are all kind of rough. I didn't, I didn't put anything for there of clouds or anything. So uh, you can use it as a starting point. But you want to make sure that when you have your plan that it's flexible enough that you can deal with changes uh, in, in weather and conditions. Um, do, of course, check the manuals if they exist. If you're observing in a major facility like Keck or Gemini, you might be able to go and find online the documentation.
information about how the instrument works and stuff. Um, if you're um, not observing at one of these facilities, like if you're observing a smaller facility, uh, you might need to go ask somebody. You know, you might have to, to ask me if you're using MLO or something. Uh, how, how to use things, or ask the last guy I used it. Um, so keep, uh, you know, it, it's, but make sure you, you know what you're doing before you go. That's the main thing. All right. Um, also, you got to know what kind of data you're going to be taking. You're going to have to um, calibrate your data. So we, we want to get as many photons as we can from those sources. But then at the end of the day, we also want to put a, a physical number usually on those. We don't just want to say, hey, I got 10 photons. You know, you, that's not a paper. A paper is, this is the flux of that object, you know. So you need to have that conversion factor. So you might need to know things if you're doing imaging. You need to know, how many counts do I get if I don't even open the shutter? You need your bias level. Uh, if I put the same number of counts on each pixel, what is the relative number of counts that I get? So you need flat field information. Uh, you might actually want to do absolute phot photometry, in which case you want to observe some standard stars and actually measure how many counts you get from them so you can calibrate your, your instrument properly. Uh, same kind of thing is very similar for spectroscopy. We'll talk about spectra tomorrow. You still need biases. You need flats. The fun thing with spectroscopy uh, is that for each pixel, you're going to have a different wavelength covered, right? And just to be extra fun, that can be different from night to night. The instruments can change a little bit. So you need to calibrate that. You need some arc lamps that says this wavelength corresponds, to, this pixel corresponds to this wavelength. And you also might want to do standard stars. It depends on your science program, again, about what you're actually going to do here. All right, a couple more things. Almost there. All right, uh, you've got to make a plan. So once you're set, once you say, okay, I know what targets I'm looking at, I know what instrument I'm using, I've calculated signal noise, and I know how, my exposure times. This came out weird. Why did it come out like that? Do it like that. That's better. Um, you're going to have a plan for how you're going to do things. Um, there is some software that will help you do this, but I think it's worth actually just sitting down with a pencil and paper and actually writing it down, at least for the first few times you observe, to kind of figure out how you're going to do things. So what I like to do is I like to, to just write down a list, and I start with times, the critical times we talked about at the beginning. When does sunset? When does twilight end? Um, when, get out of here. There we are. That's weird. Um, When's twilight end? When does the twilight begin? When's the end of the night? When am I done? Why can't I go to sleep? Um, these are important things to know. When's the middle of the night? You might want to know that. And then I'll just list the things I need to do in the order I, I want to do them initially. So before sunsets, I can take some calibration data. During twilight, I can focus the instrument. I can do, observe bright standard stars. And then maybe I have some target order that I want to do. All right. And maybe in here, maybe there's important things like when the moon sets, or maybe there's a really important target. I want to make sure that at this time I'm observing this target here. So I'll put that in there. And then what you can do once you have this on, uh, all written down, you take that to the telescope, and then it's cloudy and you, you totally change your plan. <laughs> right? So you get, that's, that's why you do it this way. You need some flexibility. You've got to say, like, okay, this was my plan in a perfect night, but it turns out that it's cloudy. There's no way I'm going to do this target because the exposure time, you know, maybe it's three times longer. All right, and I don't want to spend three hours on this target because then I can't get this one. So you, you cross that off and you go to the next one on the list and you have some plan ahead of time. So this way you're not wasting time at the, at the telescope. When you're there, you're like, well, I was going to observe this stuff, but now it's cloudy and you, know, you start wasting time. So make sure you have a nice plan ahead of time. Um, ba -ba -ba. We can go back into... Really? There's more, I promise. Somewhere, okay, there you go. Uh, so do consider all these things, rise times, set times, moon phases, target priorities. Maybe, maybe there's one target that's going to get you that, that postdoc. So make sure that's the one that you observe. You know, put all your eggs in button baskets. Sometimes a good strategy, but um, make sure you know how, how, how you're weighting your priorities and have a plan for what you're going to do if weather changes. Um, there's a nice tool called JSkyCalc uh, that I like to use. Um, myself, uh, you have a little widget. Oops, oops. It looks like this, and you can put up a little picture of the sky like this, and you can enter coordinates, and it'll show you where they are in the sky. And you can uh, move to uh, the future. You can step forward, and you can see what happens after sunset. Uh, it's a fun little tool. This has been around for a while. Um, but it's, it's something you can easily download and, and get running pretty quickly. 
Uh, of course, you guys you all have computers in front of you with Python, so you can actually code all this up yourself. Uh, it's actually not that hard. You can actually do this now uh, with, with Python pretty, pretty easily. Um, and there is a package called AstroPlan that will get you most of the way there. So AstroPlan is what you're going to be doing in your modules. Um, that'll help you do all these things, calculate sunrises and sets, and even to have some stuff to do with target scheduling. So uh, there's a lot in, in there, and um, there's a lot to learn from. So I think that's my time here, so I think I'll stop there and let you guys uh, get started on the module. Okay. Before we get to the module, was, was there any questions? Anything you guys wanted to work out? Ready to observe. Ready to observe. We got some observers here. It's good. Uh,